there's one topic um, that's of increasing importance worldwide, and that's the use of emotions in politics. We see that um, a lot of political campaigns uh, try to appeal to emotions. Um, and that uh, either means to make people enthusiastic about something or to uh, uh, evoke feelings like uh, anxiety or fear of something. And what we know from um, research now is that emotions can do something that arguments or normal campaigns are unable to do. Emotions can persuade people that are usually not persuaded by substantial arguments. So even though you have a certain party stand or if you have a political ideology, if a campaign succeeds in evoking emotions in yourself, you start listening to arguments that you normally wouldn't listen to. Normally we, we, we have a model of political campaigning that would assume, well, let's bring out the best arguments and everyone um, you know, brings forth uh, his or her arguments and then the, the public has to decide what are the best arguments, what's the direction this, of this country should go to. With emotions it's different. Emotions can have effects on our thinking, on our attitudes and also on our voting behavior uh, without um, deliberative decision. Um, um, uh, that has taken place. So they can be powerful tools also to increase the power of our feelings and decrease the power of arguments. When it comes to research, this is hardly understood. We don't know much about it. Uh, we, we see it out there and we see the use of emotions in campaigns. We also see uh, the rise of populist parties in Europe, um, but um, it's a, still a long way to prove the um, the specific role of that emotions play in this context. And I think this is a, an important, uh, really important research topic for the future. We only can generate knowledge in a field if the methods we use are appropriate. If we use poor methods, the knowledge we create, the insights we create, are to some extent um, flawed or even, maybe even false. Uh, this is especially true for a field like communication that kind of cross-cuts several dis disciplines that um, uh, works with concepts from political science, from psychology, from sociology and from uh, marketing or business administration as well. Communication scholars also need to keep the pace when it comes to development of methods in all those fields. Otherwise all your theories, all your thinking is really hard to, to translate in an empirical project. What we see in the last decades is that our research is becoming more and more globally accessible. A lot of research in political communication research for decades has been dominated by uh, US scholarship. Uh, when we talk about political campaigns, we are talking about US campaigns. When you look at the um, public opinion research, we are talking about US public opinion. Uh, but of course, the mechanisms, the contexts, and the effects differ in, in, uh, across continents and also across countries. So we cannot necessarily generalize these insights we have from other countries to other political systems, to other media systems. So we need to um, uh, rise in our awareness of that and we need to conduct research that system systematically addresses uh, those questions. I don't think I can, I can make the world a better place with the stuff I do, with the research I do. Uh, at best I can contribute on a very, on a, on a very limited scale. But still, that's, not re that's no reason not to do it. But it's just a realistic way of putting it. What I can do is, I can try to um, do research on topics that are relevant for society. Like, for instance, populist advertising, emotions in politics, or soft uh, factors that are important in a campaign like entertainment, humor, celebrity endorsements. These are important developments we have in a society, we have in political campaigns in Europe and all over the world. And what I can do is I can uh, try to contribute and help the society uh, by um, yeah, helping to, to understand what these things that we can observe do with us. I cannot change these things, but I can uh, offer knowledge uh, of what these things mean and uh, what impact they have on our society. That's what I can do. We are not politicians, we cannot make those changes, but we can generate knowledge that can be helpful in this respect respect to change things, also to, to uh, contribute to a better way of life, if you will so. As a researcher using uh, social scientific methods, I try to be as objective as I can. And uh, I try to generate knowledge, but I cannot prefer knowledge that is in line with my norms 
or uh, kind of downplay knowledge that is not in line with my norms. Uh, if, for instance, um, I think that um, according to my norms or my values, populist advertising is, not, is, is something bad, uh, how objective is my research then? So um, I have to be as objective as possible to deliver knowledge that is uh, accessible to, um, independent of your own ideology, independent of your, of your own norms. Where your norms play a role in your research is um, the, the, the research topics you identify. There's of course a norm, there's, there are norms play a role here. What do you think is important? So we, there are norms in the beginning when we, when we pick up a problem that we, do research, that we do research on because according to, to our norms this is a problem. And at the end we compare our findings with those, with those norms again. But in the middle I try to be as unnormative as I can. Uh, if you try to um, at some point, try to put your norms kind of to the back. Um, then you deliver knowledge that at the end of the day, I think is more credible and can also have a larger impact.